1540 to 1550 Bloor Street West, also known as the draft site. I'm Diane Silver. I'm the planner with the City of Toronto. And here's our agenda tonight. And right now I'm going to hand it over to Councillor Gord Perks to start with the land acknowledgement and opening remarks. Councillor. Thanks, Diane. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Welcome, everyone. Uh, this is... Uh, one of the first virtual planning meetings that I've done uh, since the pandemic hit the city of Toronto. And I'm gonna ask you all to be patient with, with us uh, as we work our way through it. Tonight, we're gonna see a presentation from Toronto City staff and a presentation from the developers uh, for this property. And then we're gonna have a question and answer uh, period. Uh, be patient as we go through all of that and be aware that there will be other opportunities for you to send your comments in by email or by phoning myself or Diane, who's the city staff, staff person on the planning file. I just want to say a couple of things by way of background. Many of you will remember that a little over a decade ago, uh, we saw an application on this same site that <clears throat> bore a lot of similarities to the application that we're currently seeing and that that uh, led to us doing uh, a community planning study for the area known as the Dundas Bloor Avenue bylaw, which is still in effect and still is planning policy on this site. We also uh, had the developer take the city to the Ontario Municipal Board where the city was successful in saying that their application uh, didn't constitute good planning. A couple of years ago, the current property owners approached me and said that they were considering bringing a development to this property. At that time, they were looking at 30 stories and I referred them to the previous OMB decision and said that I thought they were way out of line with what the city would consider. Then in November of last year, the applicants did file a, a formal application, again, for a building that was taller than what our existing planning rules said we would consider. In July, the applicant filed an application to go to the Ontario Municipal Board to have a hearing over this. The purpose of tonight's meeting is to hear from members of the community uh, to answer questions you have, but also to give our planning staff advice on the issues that matter to you, concerns you might have, uh, observations you might have because you live right there near this building. Um, and those opinions, advice, and concerns will be considered by city planning staff as they write the report asking council to give them directions on what to do with this application and the appeal. You have a, a very uh, good, uh, excellent staff team here, uh, led by Diane, supported by her manager, Dan Nicholson, uh, some additional planning staff, transportation planning staff, urban design planning staff and a housing planning staff person because there is an issue here of rental replacement as well. Um, Diane's also gonna give you a little bit of insight into how you can share your thoughts, comments and questions during the meeting. But again, uh, in these times of COVID, it's, it's, it's frustrating and I ask you to bear with us and bring us your best thoughts and your, and your attention. Thanks very much. Diane, back over to you. I'll just flip to the agenda page and give people an opportunity to review it while I go through some introductions. Um, city staff that are here today, obviously myself, I'm Diane Silver, I'm the community planner on the file. Dan Nicholson, who's my manager. Bruna Negro, who's my community planning colleague. And you'll hear Bruna's voice later on as she um, provides, introduces questions. In addition, are Joseph Luke in urban design. Trevor Greenman from Transportation Planning, and Keir Matthews Hunter from Housing Policy, and finally, Daniel Reynolds from Transportation Services. 
In addition, we've also got the applicant with us, and that would be Matthew Lang from the Trinity Group, Peter Smith from Browsefields, and Kenneth Chan from Lee Consulting. So I'll begin with my presentation, and then the applicants will follow with their presentation. And following that, we'll have a facilitated discussion as moderated by Councillor Perks. And that'll be your opportunity to ask questions, provide comments, and we'll respond to those uh, questions. Also, you can start using um, it's the Q&A um, slot. You can send in your comments. They don't have to be questions, so you can start sending us comments as you feel they're coming, and I'll just go through the slides right now. And I want to inform everyone that this meeting's being recorded and it'll be posted online for future viewing. And just some WebEx uh, matters. So with the WebEx functionality, we're using Q&A function, but that doesn't limit yourself to questions. You can write anything in there, comments. So just look for the three dots, which is the menu, and then the Q&A um, option will appear, and then select it. And depending on the device you're using, this is for computer, or if you're using a tablet or smartphone, it might appear on a different corner of your screen. But essentially, it's the same. And just to give you some troubleshooting tips, if you can't hear the presenter speaking, your first option would be to disconnect the headset and use the PC laptop speakers. And your second option would be to connect to the audio conference with the landline or mobile cell. And of that process, step one would be to click on the audio button by hovering at the bottom of the screen, as you can see with the icon to the left. The second step would select the call me at feature and then enter the 10 digit telephone number that you want to use to connect. And that number will be provided on the next slide. Following that, click connect audio button next to the phone number and then answer the phone and follow the prompts to join the audio conference. So here's the phone number 416-915-6530. And when prompted for the meeting number, enter 133-384-1776. This information is the same information you would have already received on your inv invitation for this meeting. So this isn't new, but it's just a um, a little reminder if that helps. And before we just go into the meeting, just want to cover off some meeting rules. Um, one voice at a time for questions. Please be direct and frame your questions to specific speakers. Stay focused, remain from multitasking in order to avoid distracting others. Be brief and limit yourself to one question or comment at a time. There will be other opportunities to engage. And as the counselor mentioned, um, this is just the beginning. You can email me. Um, you can send a letter in regular mail. You can call me on the telephone or the counselor's office. So tonight isn't the last night we're collecting uh, comments. There's still plenty of time to provide comments because quite often people leave meetings and think of things that they forgot to bring up. So don't be concerned about that. Also, be a good listener and keep an open mind. Raise your hand to ask questions. And most important, be respectful. The City of Toronto is an inclusive public organization. And racist and other forms of discriminatory, prejudicial, or hateful comments and questions will not be tolerated. And finally, engage with high energy. Be personable as you would in person. So moving on to the planning process presentation. Um, just to give you a quick overview, um, as a community planner, I have to review, do analysis, look at the facts, the figures, go to the physical site, review the context, I go through many layers of policies, a top-down approach from provincial policies down to the local level with the official plan and area studies, such as one that's applicable for the site. Um, in addition, there's um, considerations of council, former council decisions, and decisions from the former Ontario Municipal Board or the local planning appeal tribunal, committee adjustment, et cetera. And the reason why we're here tonight is we're reaching out to you, the community, to find out your opinions, your questions, your concerns, your comments. So I need, I'm here to listen and I wanna hear your comments. And 
this is just a survey of some of the types of documents that I would review during an application process. I know a lot of you are very familiar with the site, so I, I won't spend too much time on going through the context, but the red star represents subject site. It abuts the TDC station to the north, Dundas West, and it's flanked by two arterials, Dundas Street West and Bloor Street West, and it's in close proximity to the GO Rail Corridor and the Union Pearson Up Express. The site area is 2,467 square meters and it's four properties assembled. Bloor Street frontage is approximately 54 meters and the lot depth approximately just over 41 meters. And here are the four properties with the property addresses, just to provide some context. And with the official plan, there's an urban structure map and Dundas West and Bloor Street West are identified as designated avenues, and these are areas where uh, they form part of the, the city's um, growth management strategy in the official plan. So this is where we direct more growth as compared to with neighborhoods, which are lower density areas, for instance. And these are segments of main commercial streets that can accommodate new housing and jobs uh, while improving public realm conditions as well. And as it happens, an avenue study was done for the subject site in greater area several years ago, uh, which is required in advance of applications. And just moving ahead to the official plan, the land use map, as you can see, the subject site is in red, which means it's a mixed use area designation. And with this designation, it's intended to absorb a portion of Toronto's anticipated growth and it's about reducing car dependency and creating opportunities for new residential units and where people can work and accommodating commercial uses to support live work conditions. Um, but it's also important to note that it just doesn't mean it's unlimited intensification. It varies dependent on the context and the area. So it's not a cookie cutter approach. It's very context specific. And the Bluer Dundas Avenue study, which the councillor was referencing earlier, um, that was city initiated in 2008. And the intent of this is to provide a long term plan for, air, for the area in terms of a, a, a vision and a policy framework of how development should unfold. The subject site with a slightly different land assembly was identified as opportunity site number three. There were eight opportunity sites, and this one was selected and reviewed and analyzed. And out of this work uh, came instruments um, that implement the work, such as the zoning bylaw number 1222-2009 and urban design guidelines that would complement the zoning bylaw uh, performance standards. And finally, the councillor had referenced an earlier application that went to the Ontario Municipal Board where the city was successful in its outcome. And there are two applications with this um, project, and one of them is related to rental housing and demolition conversion. So rental housing is very important to the city and the preservation of its stock. It's a very high priority. And this is triggered when there are six or more units on a site, and in our case, there's uh, 12. And there's a requirement for the landowner to replace the rental units with the same number, size, and type of similar rents, and importantly, to secure tenant rights to, to return and tenant relocation assistance processes. Just going into a high level of the zoning for the subject site, it has split zoning, which means it has two different zoning bylaws applicable to the overall site. The first one is with the avenue study that came out of the avenue study and it's mixed commercial residential use and you can see the map on the right and it shows you where the heights are 32 meters maximum sort of on the easterly corner portion but then it transitions down towards the northwesterly end to 20 meter maximum height and the density maximum is five times five times the overall area of the land and there's building lot line setback standards, among many other performance standards. Those are just a few. 
And the other portion of the site, which is highlighted in red, those are the four properties and they have the same zoning category. However, the maximum height is 16 meters. The density is a bit lower at four times the area of that overall lot within the red bounded area. And for instance, the 45 degree front angular plane is required among other performance standards. So there's the two different zoning that apply. And then finally, the citywide zoning bylaw, as you can see the subject site, which is the red dot, it's within a grade area, which means this site has not been brought into the citywide zoning bylaw at this time. However, with new development applications at the end of the process, we will bring them in and we will draft a bylaw. So that will be in the citywide zoning bylaw. At the moment, this bylaw is under appeal, so it's not enforced in effect, but hopefully the appeals will be finished maybe in about a year. But, um, and just briefly, uh, just a highlight of the applicant's proposal, um, because the applicant will go in much further detail, but they're proposing a 25-story mixed-use residential commercial building, a height 80.6 meters plus six meter mechanical, a density of 10.7, two times the area of the lot, gross floor area over 26,000 square meters, 100 car parking spaces on two levels below ground. And I'll just skip to the next slide. And the status of the applications, the application came in last December and in the summer, the zoning bylaw application was appealed to the local planning appeal tribunal, also known as LPAT. However, the rental housing application isn't appealable, so that's why you won't see that going through the process. But the rental housing pro, uh, application can't proceed until a decision, until we go through the end process, uh, through the hearing with the zoning bylaw application. And finally, I want to apprise everyone that I've written a staff report. It's a request for directions report to the October 15th Toronto and East York Community Council meeting, so if you can watch for that. Um, this report's asking council to give authorization so that I can attend the LPAT hearing to support the city's uh, position and that the appropriate staff can uh, join me as well, among other recommendations, and I'll give a lot of details in the application. And also you can write in to community council at that time, send in your comments. It's another opportunity among many to relay comments that you might find later. And also, if you check the website approximately a week before, you should be able to pull up my staff report on the city's website. So I'm going to hand the proposal over to, or the presentation, I should say, to the applicant. They'll go through their presentation package now. Um, thanks very much, Diane. My name is Peter Smith. I'm a land use planner with Bousefields, and I'm working for um, the applicant. Now, um, Let's see. Oh, okay. So if we go, could go to the next slide, um, there's going to be some overlap with uh, the slides that Diane presented. So I'm going to go very quickly over those. If we could go to the next slide, I just want to spend a little bit of time on this um, just uh, to go ahead. So this is a transit map. And one of the things that it shows is that this is one of the most uh, transit supportive locations in the entire city. And a lot actually has changed since back in 2009, 2010, uh, when the Avenue bylaw was passed and when the OMB at that time dealt with the um, original giraffe application. So one of the things I'm going to talk about is some of those changes. Um, but what this shows is um, the transit facilities in the area. So there's the Dundas West Subway station, which of course is immediately north of the subject site. Um, just across the street is the Bloor Go and UP Express station. The UP Express station obviously is new since last time that uh, service was introduced in 2015. And Metrolinx is working on um, the Kitchener Go line um, in terms of electrification uh, and introducing Go RER service, which is regional express rail, which is something that you'll see in the future. Um, 
as we move a little bit further to uh, the east along Bloor Street, um, there's actually another new GO station that is in the process of being planned by Metrolinx on the Barry line, which will also be uh, converted to GO RER. And uh, that's the Bloor Lansdowne station. And the intention is that the Bloor Lansdowne station in turn will be linked with the Lansdowne subway station. And you can see all of these overlapping uh, 250 meter radii around all of these transportation uh, higher order transit facilities in this area. And um, as I say, much of that is new investment um, and the number of different transit supportive uh, facilities in the area uh, is really uh, um, unusual and um, almost unique within the city. Not quite, but, but almost unique. Next slide, please. Um, one of the other things that's new since last time is that there really has been an increased emphasis on planning for intensification in association with transit. And part of that is the recognition on behalf of the province and Metrolinx um, that with the amount of money that is being invested in higher order transit, it is really, really important to put people close to these transit facilities where they can take advantage of proximity to transit, uh, reduce car dependency, and do all of those types of things that the official plan also speaks to. So you can see in the left-hand image, the subject site, obviously given its location, is located within the primary zone. Um, and so on the right-hand side is the um, more um, conceptual delineation of what a major transit station area looks like. The uh, bright orange color in the middle is the primary zone. The subject site is within the primary zone. And um, Metrolinx has issued both a regional transportation plan as well as uh, mobility hub guidelines. It's identified this area as a mobility hub. And it says within 250 meters, that's where the highest intensity of development is to be encouraged. Uh, that was 2011, again, new since the last time uh, the OMB dealt with, uh, with this property. So um, if we can go to the next couple of slides, um, Diane already touched on this. Just the, the one thing I wanna emphasize about, emphasize about the avenues is that, first of all, this is a site that's located actually at the intersection of two avenues which is somewhat unusual within the city structure. And the other thing is that the avenues are a structural element, which as Diane acknowledges, is where growth is encouraged to be located. And particularly in terms of avenues, avenues are supposed to emphasize residential growth. Um, the next slide um, shows the land use designations. Again, mixed use area. One of the things I just want to highlight is that the yellow area uh, neighborhoods, which is normally obviously uh, associated with low rise residential neighborhoods. In this case, um, the, uh, the yellow neighborhood that you can see immediately north of the site is actually the, um, the TTC subway tracks, the subway station and so on. And the neighborhoods actually begin further north um, um, the site. And so that has helped to inform our approach to height and massing on, on the subject site. Uh, next slide. Um, this is the zoning map that uh, uh, Diane showed to you. So this is what exists in terms of what was previously the draft site. And those were the heights and densities that applied. Next slide. But even the avenue bylaw, the way it was structured, as it said, if a broader consolidation of additional properties um, was achieved, um, both the permitted height as well as the permitted density could be increased. So um, you'll see on the next slide, uh, but just hold for a second before I show you that, uh, that the client has now um, acquired the properties 15, at 1542, 1544, 1548, and 1550. Hasn't acquired the property at 1552, but has now an almost complete 
assembly of the lands that were originally planned for consolidation under the avenue bylaw. And with that as well, in addition to an increase in height, um, the bylaw also allows for an increase in density from 5.5 times to seven times as of right on the site. And then just to the next slide, just to illustrate that, um, and this is obviously another change since last time, the original proposal back in 2007 involved just the uh, lands that are outlined in blue, and the current proposal is this larger site outlined in red, which includes those additional properties and allows for a better and fuller configuration and, and more comprehensive redevelopment of the corner of, uh, of Dundas and Bloor. Uh, one final slide from me. Um, next slide. Um, is um, together with all of the transit investments, the changes in policy, one of the other things that um, is starting to um, take place in terms of this area is um, increased development interest. So historically, there really has just been the crossways, the, those two buildings at 29 stories, um, but subsequent to uh, um, the uh, the previous OMB decision, there was an OMB decision further north on Dundas Street at uh, 2388, which I think you can see there, which approved uh, 23 and then ultimately 24 store building um, that was opposed by the city, but supported by the OMB in part based on um, the transit supportive location. As well, there's the application that I think most of you probably know about within the South um, the southeast quadrant of Dundas and Bloor on the Bishop Morocco and Choice property site, which includes a number of tall towers up to 42 stories in height. And as well, there's a number of other uh, developments in the area. So in terms of looking at what would be an appropriate height and an appropriate scale of development, we've also had regard to some of these other approvals as well as proposals in this broader area, all of which, again, are tied into transit supportive intensification. So with that, I'll hand it over to Matthew Lang, who will take you through the plans. So good evening. Um, I'll start with just some comments to begin with, and then I'll go through the plans. Uh, and I, I see there's some questions coming in on the side here, which is, which is really great. Uh, first, Time I have presented uh, one of these virtual meetings as well, so it's uh, a work in progress, but um, it seems to be working quite well, and uh, I like the interactivity with the questions. So um, I don't know if we're going to address them at the end, but I'll just make a couple comments in terms of Harry, uh, your question about traffic. Ken Lee, uh, sorry, Ken Chan of Lee is going to present after me. We have some slides that are specific to the traffic, uh, so he'll address that. The question, original design to the design as submitted. I'll just spend a couple of seconds on that because um, we had done a pre-application meeting uh, through the counselor's office, which was well attended. Subsequent to that meeting, we had a sort of smaller meeting. Uh, it was at our office, and we went through some of the comments that were uh, came out of that pre-application meeting, and we um, were able to dig into some of them a little bit deeper. And through that conversation, we made some revisions to the plans. And one of the comments uh, that came out of that were the idea of carrying uh, the existing streetscape in, in sort of paying homage, if you will, to the brick and the masonry as a person as opposed to the more modern podium building that we had originally contemplated. And so we made that revision the resubmission. Uh, in terms of car share, we have not yet thought of that. Um, but to Diane's earlier comment, uh, I just want to make a note to say that we have appealed this application, um, but we, want to continue the conversation with the councillor, with staff, with the community. I want to thank Councillor Perks uh, for initiating and, and scheduling this community meeting so we can carry on this conversation. And I want to thank staff for taking the time to, uh, to do it as well um, so we can continue to discuss. And um, 
just a note there. Um, some support, so awesome. Thank you for that as well, obviously. From a site plan perspective, in terms of uh, the stepping of this building, this plan here is, is pretty cool in that it shows literally all the steps that are occurring in this building. And one of the reasons for that is shadowing, which we'll show in a, a later slide. But the other reason is we really wanted to provide articulation as this building sort of progresses from that ground floor, that strong retail ground floor presence, all the way up uh, through the residential floors. So, Diane, if we go to the next slide. So here we have the retail uh, along Bloor. We want to have a really strong retail presence there. We've talked about this a lot, but uh, was really important for uh, everything that we heard in terms of providing that large setback at the corner, uh, allow the building to breathe, if you will, um, but to create that wide sidewalk, which then extends back uh, along the TTC and really to maintain that width which does pinch at a certain point related to the lobby, but then again, uh, spans out as you continue further north. It will be a right in, right out only in terms of the traffic pattern, uh, all bicycle parking provided, all loading uh, and vehicular access internal to the building. Um, we'll have a really strong lobby along Dundas to create that connectivity uh, between the two. And uh, we're working, we're still, Working on the landscape plan, this is a, basically a draft uh, in terms of uh, what we're proposing and we'll continue to build that as we go through site plan. Um, next. This is just, I'm gonna show you a series of slides how the building sort of blocks up as we move up the building. So the retail here shown in the yellow, the residential component related to the lobby in blue, and the vehicular access, et cetera, in the darker color. This is the podium building. This goes up to six stories, residential, and you can see the sort of U-shaped building in this configuration at this floor. The breakout floor, as we call it, this is the amenity uh, floor. So the residential and uh, the indoor, the outdoor amenity on this floor wrapped with residential units on the seventh floor. These are the boxes that they shift as you go up. So the first box goes to 16 and the second box goes to 22. You can see the alternating pattern in the architecture here. In the top piece, which is a terraced series of floors, 23, 24, 25, mechanical penthouse on top. So that the blue again being the residential and the yellow being the retail. This is uh, just a picture, I know all of you know it very well, but of the corner as it exists today, uh, the narrow sidewalk, we're going to be pulling all of this away um, to create that nice sort of corner element there. And this is the proposal. So again, we went with the masonry um, based on comments that we had received through the original meetings uh, to try to continue to pull that masonry from the street and bring that to the corner. We want to open that up, have some seating, Tree, uh, tree lined streets, bicycle parking will be to the left of this, um, and some really great strong retail uh, presence along the street. And then as you go north, we'll have the residential lobby on the ground floor. So this is a view if you were to the Southeast perspective, but as you are looking west, you can see the alternating patterns of the architecture, the terracing of the upper floors uh, as you go up the building. Um, we call them the boxes, shifting of the boxes to create that articulation and that interest of the building 
And then that podium, that six stories being that strong masonry presence, still keeping some of that design from the original, which was a little bit more modern in terms of, um, you can see on that east side, the way that we've broken up that section of the building. That was a, from the, the previous design, but making it more strong in terms of the masonry and the, and the color going to the brown brick there. And this is a view now, if you were looking east and you can again see how the building starts to move and pull in certain directions, the terracing elements, um, and again, the alternating architecture pattern uh, really giving interest to the building as you really, this building will look different from each vantage point that you look at it. Um, and I think we have some views looking at it uh, north to south. Well, that's the, ex that's the existing building. There we go. Uh, so you can see how this building, so just again, the way we stacked this building from the ground floor, there you see the residential lobby uh, adjacent to the driveway access that is intended to be open. Um, on that north wall, we were playing with some spandrel uh, to allow for light, but also sort of a solid wall so that uh, the loading activities, the vehicles coming in and out, et cetera, that would all be hidden from public view. Um, but we still wanted to make it interesting as opposed to just a blank wall along that entire space. Uh, the U-shaped building, you can see the cut-in uh, along that wall there with the, um, we'll do like a, um, there'll be terraces on that level, but they will be landscaped uh, to create some further interest. The amenity breakout floor on level seven with the uh, outdoor amenity on the rooftop of the you see, western portion. Um, and then that next box, the uh, seven to 16 floors is an L shape. Um, so again, from a contextual standpoint, it will look, there'll be a portion of the building that is kind of coming up that podium wall, that six-story podium wall, although set back, and then it will disappear uh, on the west side. And then that box above, which has the terracing on it, again, with that different architectural pattern, sort of pulling away and really playing with those different elements. And then we can kind of skip through these. The other thing I wanted to show on the next slide is the angular plane. And so when we had our pre-application meetings with staff, one of the important elements of discussion was the angular plane. Um, as Councilor Perks noted, we did want to come in with a 30-story building. And um, through those conversations and through to the application submission, we dropped to 25. And we terraced that of those upper portions to deal with that 45 degree angular plane, which will uh, impact the shadows, which we'll also show. And here, this one also, just what I was sort of saying in terms of the way this building again steps back from the northern property line. So, not only are the boxes sort of shifting uh, in an east west pattern, north south pattern, different architecture as you go up the building, I was really playing with all these shapes and um, patterns. And that's, of course, the north, and again, viewing it from the other side to show the angular plane as it relates to uh, that would be the west elevation of the building. Shadow studies for June, obviously, these will be short shadows being the summer shadows. Uh, this goes from nine till noon. And from one until 4, 18. March, September being the long shadows uh, at nine o'clock, 10, 11 and noon. And what we wanted to do here, uh, there's that discussion about quick moving shadows and um, really wanting that shadow to move off of properties every hour. And so 
By doing the 45 degree angular plane, we were successful in moving that shadow quite quickly, um, as you can see here. And then the next slide will take us until 418 again. Uh, Diane already went through the statistics, so just quickly, 327 units. Uh, I think important to note that we are uh, complying with the growing up guidelines, 26% two bedrooms, 10% three bedrooms. And in terms of parking, we are two levels of parking, 100 total parking spaces, 80 of those being residential and 20 being shared visitor and commercial. Visitor commercial will share the parking. Uh, in the P1 level. And so now I'm going to pass it off to Ken, who can take you through the traffic. Yes, thank you very much, Matthew. Um, and, and if some of, some of those questions come through, uh, we're the traffic consultant. We have prepared a traffic impact study uh, in support of the proposed application. Uh, city staff is reviewing those, those documents, and, um, and this is a typical process where the uh, the um, development team hires a consultant and we uh, conduct the necessary study for the city staff to review. Um, but this, what we have here is what we call uh, a trip assignment. And uh, based on that gentleman's response or question, yes, we do expect uh, cars to come through Gravel and um, onto Eden, uh, making the right turn to Dundas into the site. One thing that I do want to emphasize, uh, and Matthew touched upon it, is that the proposed access um, from Dundas will be restricted to right in, right out only. Um, so therefore, this will minimize disruption um, to the streetcar operation, uh, especially for streetcars going northbound into, um, into, into the CTC site. Um, and, and just for reference, um, during the PMP period, we expect the highest level amount of cars all the sites. Um, and that's roughly, um, you can see it's, it's by the um, parenthesis numbers. So we are roughly at 61 vehicles during the PM peak hour. Um, and what this equates me to is, is roughly, um, and that's two way, uh, so in and out. And this um, equates to roughly less than one car per minute um, coming into and out of the sites. Next slide, please. And as part of our analysis, we, we want to really focus is on, on the constraint of the existing condition uh, of the driveway. Well, you can see on the pictures on your right, and most of you are very familiar, is that there's a pinch point of where that building or existing building is um, just right after the, uh, the TTC building or the streetcar uh, exits. And you can see where our site relatively from a schematic diagram perspective, shown on the left side, where it's, it's uh, the proposed right in right out access is. Um, next slide, please. And on the next slide, we want to emphasize that from a traffic impact perspective, one of the key things that we looked at was how will cars coming in and out of this development interact with pedestrians walking along Dundas. You can see from the magenta line that's a bit hidden, that's basically where the existing building is. Um, so when you walk up along Dundas, you're really walking up along this tight um, uh, pedestrian walkway. And you can see where it, it, this building, where we have drawn blue triangle, that's actually where the building starts, um, sort of, uh, I would say a third away from where the car is. So you can see that the, 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 uh, the amount of a breathing room for pedestrian really more than doubles than, than what's up there right now. And in and, and our perspective is that when a car is exiting the driveway, it would have a clear sight of the, of, of the sidewalk. This allows um, drivers to, to react um, to pedestrian as well as really enhancing the existing, um, what, what I would consider the, uh, the interaction between pedestrian and, and cars. Um, in our analysis, uh, this is also confirmed that all the tr all the trucking activity is it is within the site. There will be no backing up of trucks uh, or any delivery vehicles or any cars um, onto Dundas Street because there's sufficient room sufficient room on site to do all those movements. So cars are always entering and exiting in a forward motion. Next slide, please. And last but not least, there's a comment or questions um, with respect to the laneway. Um, this proposed uh, development is, is just a will close this segment. Um, this is to emphasize that this narrow section of driveway currently, it, it is private property. 
Um, and if we look at the previous drawing, you can see that that's where actually all the bike rooms uh, will be located. Uh, in our opinion, is that this will direct this will provide direct um, access for cyclists um, to come right through into the bike room area, which where you see now, uh, which enhance the um, um, let's call it the urban context and not having cars driving through. And this is, uh, uh, in our opinion, a very big space. And, and that is uh, good access for cyclists uh, to the site. That that completes my analysis and review uh, of the uh, transportation component. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, before we go into our discussion portion of this uh, meeting, I just want to draw everyone's attention. Uh, you have the option to raise your hand on the computer, uh, click on the button with the three dots or the menu option button at the bottom of the video window and select raise hand. Um, so I'm going to hand the floor over to Councillor Perks, who's going to moderate the discussion. And Bruna, my colleague, is going to read out questions. And we've also had residents who have written in uh, leading up to this meeting who were unable to attend. So we've got questions to, from people who aren't here and and so forth. So, Councillor, please take it away. And okay. Bruno, uh, and, Br and Bruna. Bruna will read the questions out and you can chair the floor. Okay. Bruna, what have you got for us? Perfect. So we're going to start with some written comments that we received by email. Um, if that's okay with you, Counselor. So Joanne had written in and she said, hi, Diane, I'm in favor of giving them the 25 floors. I opposed the uh, giraffe and we won. The building has more space and is a better design. It is right beside the subway and people, uh, people need places to live um, and I'd also ease the traffic if it, there was a no car building. So she wants to know if that option has been thought about. Okay, so uh, a couple of things on that, and then I'm gonna ask staff if they have any further uh, thoughts. The first is uh, Peter from the applicants team um, did make reference to the fact that when the city uh, went to the OMB over this building uh, 10, 12 years ago, that we came to a decision that said, if you get the buildings further west, you can go taller. Peter's absolutely correct, that was the decision. What Peter didn't say though, is what the OMB decided is, if you only have the one property, you can go to 10 stories, but if you get the additional properties, you can go to 15. So obviously 25 is more than 15. So I'm, I'm a little disappointed in you, Peter, but yes, uh, with the additional width, you can do a bit more. Um, in terms of, uh, whether we could do a car-free building here. Uh, city planning has policy around that. Uh, for a number of smaller buildings in my ward, I've looked at that. For a building of this size, I, I can't imagine with this number of units that there would be zero cars. But even if there were zero cars, you still need for the stores that are there, for visitors, and for garbage going in and out, and deliveries, people moving in and out, you need vehicle access. And so a zero car doesn't, a zero car building, which I don't think would be entirely practical, still doesn't solve that problem. I have more I could say on the transportation piece, but I'm wondering if any of the city staff wanted to add to those comments. I'm wondering if um, this could be directed to Daniel Reynolds and transportation services. Uh, just to add to that, I mean, uh, in terms of zero cars, uh, as the counselor mentioned, um, I hope all you can hear me, by the way. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, okay. um, um, in terms of zero cars, no zero parking on site, it, it is, there are, have been a couple of sites in, like, closer to the downtown core. Um, I can think of the one at University in Dundas, and I've seen a few recent applications that are pushing in that direction. But as the counselor mentioned, we're not really... Transportation services is not in a position to just to to move completely in that direction. And as Councilor highlighted, there still needs to be some uh, space on site for visitor parking, pick up a drop off, and various other activities. So that's 
that's the thinking around that at this time. Uh, but obviously, um, you know, we, we that's can, that can be in flux. But we're 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 comfortable with where we're at right now with the parking. What else have you got, Bruna? Um, so we have a, a, a second question that's through email that, oh, can you hear me? Yeah, perfect. Awesome. Okay, that came in from Kathy Hutt, and she would like to see more afford affordable units being offered because, in her opinion, 12 out of the 327 seems too small of a ratio. That, that's very thoughtful. Um, one of the uh, issues here is that the City of Toronto doesn't have the authority to just say, you will do uh, a whole lot of affordable housing. We've asked the province to give us that authority through something called inclusionary zoning. Um, we're still going back and forth with the province on that, but we don't have anything in force that would allow us to impose it here. If the applicants were building, were, were choosing to work with the city on getting to yes, instead of going straight to the OMB as fast as they could, we could enter into a conversation to see if they voluntarily wanted to put some affordable housing beyond their absolute minimum that they have to do to replace the affordable housing units that were lost when the building was initially bought and vacated. Um, also, uh, Kier, I would like to direct this to Kier so he can help also elaborate because what I found is Diane speaking, in communications during the week uh, with applicant or residents, I should say, I think there's confusion around the 12 rental replacement units. They are required. They're, they're yeah. not new rental. So I think if Kier can kind of explain um, the difference between those two categories of units, because I think there's confusion. Residents think these are newly proposed 12 units. Sure, yeah. Um, yeah, I can provide some insight of that, Dan. Um, you know, as Diane was mentioning within her presentation, we have policies and official plan as well as our end housing demolition and conversion bylaw um, that allows us to secure uh, replacement rental housing that's proposed to be demolished. Uh, right now, there are 12 units in existing sites, um, only one of which is occupied, uh, and all of them have affordable rents. So we'd be requiring the applicant to replace those 12 units, and that's the plan. Um, and a key feature of that is it's, that part is not um, it's not a part of the appeal to the LPAT, right? So there's that that there's no kind of questions asked there. Those will be replaced. Um, but as the councilor said, you know we we have very few tools at our disposal to require, um, if any, to require affordable housing. What what have you got next, Bruna? Awesome. So now I'm going to go through some of the questions and answers, or sorry, the questions that were uh, typed out this uh, since the presentation started. So just bear with me a moment, please. So um, the first question is by George, and he would like to understand why do the developer change their original design with two floors of retail and a much more pleasant design? I, I don't know why the developer made that decision. So I uh, addressed that in the presentation. George wrote a follow-up comment to that. And um, I believe his comment was to not necessarily, the, the community is in transition and to not necessarily fall in love with the brick, um, which is points well taken, George. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Um, the next question we uh, received was from uh, Tanya Bruce, who said, are you including any car share programs within the building, example as a zip car, to encourage less car ownership? So I, I, I can address that briefly and then I'll turn it over to the applicant. Um, some, sometimes uh, when the city and the applicant are working well together, we make an agreement to set aside a certain amount of the parking spaces to be available for a car share program, uh, auto share or, or whatever. Uh, because the applicant, as I've said, has chosen not to work with the city, but is instead directly appealing, we haven't had those conversations yet. Um, if, they, if they wanted to consider it, 
fine, we could do that. But it's worth remembering, you know, I can't enter and the city can't enter into a conversation about a, solving that problem when the building is still 40% bigger than uh, what our bylaws would, would want to see on the site. Why don't we just go to the next question? I don't think we need to hear from the applicant on that. Okay. So the next question we received was from Ernest, and he would like to, or they would like to know who owns the pedestrian bridge on Dundas North of the site at, at Glen Lake? Oh, geez, that would either be the city or Metrolinx. I, I'm sorry, I don't forget, I don't remember which. Uh, and, and I'll tell you that, you know, although it's nice that that amenity is there, uh, it in no way is going to solve any of the transportation problems that will result from having an overdeveloped building on this site. Um, you know, and I'm, I'm glad the developer is looking at, think, at right in, right out, but that's a minimum requirement for handling the transportation needs. As those of you who were part of the previous study on this site will remember, it's not just the car traffic going into this intersection that's a problem. If there are three cars queuing to turn right into this building, you're blocking the access of the uh, King Roncesvalles streetcar, which is the busiest surface transit route in North America. We also know that the pedestrian traffic in this area during the peak period is huge and adding yet another uh, conflict on that site would be a problem as well. I acknowledge that they, they want to uh, expand the sidewalk to help with that. That was in the previous application too, though. Next. Perfect. Okay, Councillor, the next question is from Tanya Bruce, and it says, what have you done in terms of researching wind? Currently, when we stand at this corner, it can be incredibly windy, so we have so have you looked at the wind tunnels? So uh, that's a great question. Um, when a developer brings in a proposal, they're required to provide us with a whole ton of different studies, pedestrian traffic we've talked about, the mix of units we've talked about. That one of the ones that they are required to provide is a wind study. Now, it's just a theoretical model. It's, it's you know, it's not like they actually put a model, scale model of their building in a wind tunnel. They just do a little bit of math. But that's part of what the city reviews and uh, comments on. If you're curious about those studies, you can either contact my office or Diane, or you can simply go on Google, put in the address of the site, and eventually you'll find yourself on the city's application review for this address and you can see their submitted wind study there. Correct. Okay, Councillor, right. next uh, question is gonna be from Joseph. He's actually raised his hand and he's part of the meeting today. So I'm going to unmute his mic so he can ask his question verbally. Great. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Hi, um, so I, um, as this is a community meeting, I would like to speak as a member of the media community. Um, I spent the day looking over the documentation included in the application details on the city website. I noticed in a few of the documents uh, put together by Bluefield Inc., including the uh, planning and urban design rationale, there were sections that pertain to the immediate surroundings that detailed the uh, bank of retail space along Glore next to the um, proposed development. And even in the sort of way that we've been speaking about this development today, um, including when Peter earlier said that the neighborhood started further north of the planned development, that's not true. There is a laneway next to this proposed development that um, includes a lot of tenants who are renting and would be, um, I think, very disturbed by this development taking place. Um, and I can speak to that as a, <laughs> a resident of 1552. Floor Street West in, uh, in the basement here at the chiropractic office. Um, <laughs> like, uh, I just want to, uh, I want to uh, just ask about uh, if planning has considered the impact of the community that literally immediately surrounds this plan development and whether there will be uh, measures taken to ensure that there's no hazards of dust and debris, uh, the proper access to the units that will be disrupted because my stairwell down here 
is literally 11 feet from the building that's going to be demolished. And the, uh, the shadows that uh, one of your team was uh, showing recently basically covers my unit, the one window that I have here in the basement, um, every, all day, every day. So just wanted to, wanted to ask if, if that was in your planning or, or in your purview. Sure. And, and thanks for that. Um, sometimes the language we use in these planning documents has a technical meaning that doesn't that actually doesn't fit our, our own experience of, of uh, these places. In planning law, when you talk about avenues and neighborhoods, you're talking about certain kinds of building forms inside the neighborhood. So absolutely, uh, Bloor is part of the neighborhood. It's just in planning terms, we consider it to be an avenue that allows mixed use. Whereas if you go a little further north, in planning terms, that's neighborhood where we don't, for example, allow storefronts. So sure. apologies for any confusion about that. We're absolutely aware that uh, there are people uh, living even in part in some uh, parts of the site that they want to demolish and rebuild on. And that's mm -hmm. why we have the rental replacement policy here. In terms of the noise and dust and construction, that's something that we get to, uh, should this building get approved, uh, either you know the develop, developer comes back with something more reasonable and the city and the developer get to yes, or if the OMB ignores their previous decision and gives them a yes, uh, then we would move on to uh, a discussion about construction management and certainly the impacts on uh, people who live there or own property there are part of what the builder of the building has to account for uh, and they have to give us a construction management plan. But that's only a maybe and you know, if, if they get approval and that's a, after all of those other approvals take place, we wouldn't be in a conversation about a construction management plan for two years anyway. Sure. Yeah. As, as the first community meeting that has been posted publicly on that board, I just wanted to make sure that there was a proper uh, discussion of, of exactly what is around the development. No, that's very helpful. Sometimes we forget ourselves and we just use planner language instead of human being language, and I apologize. Oh, no, not at all. Thank you for your time. And, no to, that, and to that point, am I on? Yes. yes. Oh, you are. Right. Sorry. And and to that point, and going back to the land use map, and going back to the technical definition of neighborhoods, that's what that yellow area um, that abuts the site. So the Dundas West TDC station, which you wouldn't think typically is a neighborhood, you'd think more Edna Avenue to the north, where the low-rise dwellings are, but the TDC station could be redeveloped one day. It's not impossible, a lot of that does occur, but that has a neighborhood designation, which is low rise. So you're abutting a neighborhood in the technical sense. You're in the mixed use area where there's a greater amount of intensity in development, but you're right next to the planning terminology of neighborhoods. Why don't we go to someone else, Bruna? Perfect. Um, just Joseph, if you don't mind uh, removing the raise hand function from your name, just so I don't get confused. Thank you kindly. Um, the next question is, is from Graham, and it says, what's driving the U shape to the north as opposed to the south? Where is it, where, where, where it will get natural light and provide an opportunity at base for, for a front door? Does anyone from the applicant's team want to talk about those design decisions? Um, no, that's, that's a really interesting comment. Um, we'll take that one back to Charles. Um, I think part of it was building up that street wall, that podium element. But um, no, interesting, uh, interesting comment, thank you. All right, Councillor, the next question is from 
Leslie, and they are cur curious to know um, how the loading and the parking is accessed uh, from Dundas Street. So the the way the applicants have suggested doing it uh, is to have cars uh, being able to access the site only if they're traveling southbound on Dundas and turning right into the building. Once that happens, you go down a small laneway and then there's an internal loading and parking zone that you would turn into there. And then people coming out would come back along that same laneway and could only turn right and go southbound out of the building. There would be no access off Bloor. That's a very important principle there. You don't want um, our main uh, retail areas having cars cutting through them. And the developer hasn't secured uh, the necessary property so that they could uh, get out to Dorval instead. So Dundas would be the only access point. I want to point out that uh, this was also the case in the first application that we had for the giraffe, and it raised very like it was raised very serious concerns both from TTC trans T the TTC and city transportation staff. It's a lot of conflicts to manage in a very small space. <laughs> Okay, Councillor, uh, the next question is from Elise, and they would like to understand where is the base of the angular plane, and is it on Edna? So there's two different angular planes you look at, the front and rear. Uh, generally, they're, they're taken from, uh, for the front, they're taken basically at the edge of the sidewalk to the south of the building, and the rear, you're taking it to the property line, uh, for the, the properties on Edna and they're measured slightly differently. There's also a matter of height. But the idea for the rear angular plane, in most circumstances, and this is a bit different. This is why Diane goes to so much trouble to say every site is different. In a lot of circumstances, the issue would be how you're impacting people's backyards. But here, because you have the subway station where there would be backyards, uh, the, the angular plane is more about how uh, you're affecting people's front door. So it's a bit of a different set of questions that you would ask. I would note, though, that, that uh, if you look at the spring summer shadow study, which is the one our planning staff looks at the most, because that's sort of the average condition in Toronto, um, the, there are a number of uh, front lawns and porches that would be in shadow for well over an hour in those periods. Councillor, the next question is from Luciano. Has there been any any, any environmental studies uh, when through that area? There's already a serious wind flow in Dundas Bloor Street West region because of the buildings on the northeast and southwest corners of Dundas Bloor West region. Yeah, I, and we did we did discuss briefly uh, the wind studies, which are again on the on the city's application website. And to find it, you just Google the address and look for the City of Toronto link to this address, um, and you can see the applicant's wind study there. There are other environmental studies that are required as well. Uh, there's work they have to do with our uh, water and sewer guys. There's uh, something the City of Toronto has that actually. You know, I'm kind of proud of because I helped to develop back in my activist days, which are the Toronto Green Development Standards. Uh, they're a very good tool set. Uh, so those things you can see also on the application website. The next question comes from Tamara. Uh, can you describe the rationale for having two levels, 100 spots of parking? Is there anyone from the applicants team that wants to address that? I mean, I could, yeah, but I'd be putting words uh, in your mouth. No problem. Um, so what we did is we did a market study, and we based it on that as well as other information we have from developing sites on prominent corners like this, especially with the amount of public transit in the immediate vicinity. Our expectation is that the majority of the parking will be used for people that want vehicles on the weekend. Um, I think just from a practical standpoint, having that much public transit literally at your door, um, you're very likely 
to maybe drive a couple times during the week and say, you know, I think I'll use public transit, but people still want to have a vehicle or weekends or things like that. And I, I think that the person that earlier made the car share comment, um, that's something I think we'll definitely look into at some point because it also creates that flexibility that for someone that does potentially want that vehicle for the weekend, it doesn't necessarily want to buy it. Uh, a vehicle and to have to have ownership. Um, I think we satisfied the the commercial and visitor through a shared uh, facility of 20 spots on the P1 level, and that will again keep everything within the site. Um, but what we're finding also in our other sites is that the demand for parking is continuously being decreased. Um, but there's still a component of people that want that car for the what if, the what yeah. if trip. And um, thank you very much. That's that was quite helpful. Um, and you know, just to pick up on that, you know, we do a lot of studies about the transportation present and future in the city of Toronto, and we're finding increasingly that most people are becoming three or four mode travelers. They own a car, they bike to work, they walk to get their groceries. Uh, and they take transit to visit people, but the car is used for if they need to go take a trip where they've got to pick something up. So that's part of why getting those zero buildings is still maybe a little bit outside our reach. But while we're on the, the topic of the transportation study, there's something I think it's very important we have in mind. The applicant during their presentation said, look at this, there's all this new transportation infrastructure going in here. And they made reference to go RER. I, I want everyone to be aware, yes, the province has said someday they want to have an electrified. The province only in November released what's called a draft business case to put that kind of increased go service on this line. It would still have to go through five steps of approval through what they call their stage gate before it was a certainty that it was going to be done. And even then, I'd be looking 20 or 30 years out before they achieve that kind of stuff. So don't, don't take it as wholly writ that the uh, development uh, issues and the transportation options on this site are in any way significantly different than what they were 10 or 12 years ago. If you look at the number of people getting on and off the UP there, it's trivial compared to what we already have using the subway. So I, I think the development's way over, the developers way overstating their case there in terms of the transportation uh, attractiveness of this site. Councillor, the next question will be um, uh, from Mary Jo Letty. She has her hand up. So oh, I'm hey, Mary Jo. Um, Mary Jo, can you go ahead? Uh, let me see. It's not giving me the option to unmute her. Okay, I'm going to hold off and maybe she can type in her question in the queue and answer, but I'm going to go ahead and um, have the next live question from Amy. I'm going to go ahead and unmute her now. Amy, you, you're welcome to go ahead now. Hi there, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great, thank you. Thanks so much. This is a, a really great meeting. Thanks so much to all the presenters. I just want to thank the applicant for your thoughtful presentation and let you know that nobody in this neighborhood is interested in this site remaining a vacant storefront. <laughs> Certainly has a huge amount of improvement that can happen. And clearly there's been a lot of thought put into the application. I guess I just, um, as a community member, ask you to and encourage you to continue working with the city and considering the views of the local community. I know you have an interest in getting shovels in the ground, but for the long-term success of this development, i.e. being an integral part of this neighborhood, I think there's an interest in making sure that the development um, really reflects the, what the city is raising and what the local community is raising in terms of the avenue study, the concerns about traffic, um, and those types of considerations. This is a really treacherous intersection for pedestrians. I've personally been involved in an accident uh, as a pedestrian with a TTC vehicle. I have kids, um, you know, we want to keep this as safe as possible. Thank you very much. 
great comment, Amy. And and I, I couldn't have said it better myself. We would love to sit down and have a productive conversation based on uh, the actual planning rules that are in place for the area. And, you know, in terms of the, the safety there, I, you know, everyone in the neighborhood, what, what, I forget, Harry, I know Harry's on the meeting. What does he call the intersection? The hell mouth. And, you know, it, it's, it's a real concern. And, and we should remember that when Mayor Tory decided to launch his new city safety vis, uh, initiative, the Vision Zero initiative, he chose this intersection because there, you know, there have been lives lost here. This is a very, very serious and challenging intersection for pedestrian safety. And, and I hope we can do better than where we are now. And a lot of that is going to depend just in sheer volume, right? If we had a smaller building, there'd be less volume and we could manage it better. Okay, the next live question will come from Kevin Starkman. Kevin, you can go ahead. Hello? Yep. Hey, Kevin. Yep. Hey. Hi there. Um, I just have a couple questions based on, I think, the councillor's statement, one being that, you know, the area is not a transit node um, or that we there's been some discussion that it's not as represented. Um, curious how, how you see that, given that the amount of transit that's around that area, let's say relative to Union Station, um, and then I guess on your last name and saying that, you know, a smaller building helps your traffic. Well, what does that mean? Sure. Um, so, so to be precise, the comment I made had to do with something in the developer's presentation. The developer made reference to the electrification of the Kitchener Metrolinks go line, right? And how that didn't exist when the OMB ruled against the previous 27 story building. And all I'm saying is to the developer, don't put, don't put your chips on that because the province has not made a commitment in anything but the most theoretical sense that someday maybe that Kitchener line will go through. They don't even own all the property that they need uh, further north and uh, west of the city of Toronto to make that electrification a, po a practical possibility. So that, that's what I was referring to. Yes, it is a, a transit rich area as is, and we should review it the same way we review other proposals that come near subway stations. But the point Diane made at the beginning that I think is always worth bearing in mind is we don't do cookie cutter. Every site is unique. And this site has a unique challenge in terms of access, getting in and out of the site. There's nowhere else in the city of Toronto where a developer is proposing all of their deliveries, all of the visitors, all of the people who are moving in and moving out, and all the people going to work and coming home from work, doing it by cutting across the busiest surface transit route in North America, the King Ross's Vale uh, streetcar, and the Dundas streetcar on top of that. So that's what I was referring to there. In terms of the saying uh, the smaller building creates fewer challenges for transportation, that's just a measure of the volume of vehicles trying to get through that neat, narrow and treacherous spot in a given hour. Just a, a simple little thing, Let's imagine the building gets built and during uh, the evening rush hour in at certain times of day, four or five cars are queued up trying to make that right hand turn. And they're queued up because of all the pedestrians trying to get in and out, trying to walk from the subway station. Well, that four or five car queue blocks the transit, the streetcar access. If it were a smaller building, maybe that's only a one or two car queue and we can manage it better. That's what I was trying to communicate there. Next. Okay, um, next question. Since I'm unable to have Mary Jo Letty speak, uh, they had written in, so I'm just going to read it out loud if that's okay. Perfect. It says, uh, Dear Ms. Silver, 
please ensure that these items are on the agenda for this meeting. So the first one's about affordable housing. Only 12 of the units are designated for this purpose. Uh, number two is TTC. Have they been consulted and about the proposed exit and entrance? And three, have local businesses been consulted about the proposed loss of the back lane and the Bloor bike path in the front? And then four, the domino effect. Will the, do, uh, will the development set a precedent for height? What happened at the o, to the OMB ruling to restrict height? Okay, um, we, we thank you. Um, and I'll follow up with you personally, Mary Jo, uh, after this. Uh, but we have discussed the affordable housing. Just a quick recap. The 12 units that are discussed in the proposal are replacement units for existing rental buildings there. And that's within the city of Toronto's absolute purview. We can just impose that. To have a discussion about doing more than that, we have to have a willing applicant to enter into that conversation under current provincial law. I, you know me, I, I, wherever I can get an applicant to have that conversation, we do. But to this point, I, I have to be fair and sorry the applicants have to say this, but they've been rushing ahead and the conversations with the city have not been terribly productive. Um, in terms of the TTC, my understanding is they're always yep. part of the circulation. Yes. And, the city, yeah, and the city transportation yep. staff who are reviewing that plan will have those comments in hand. In terms of the consultation with local uh, businesses, well, in one sense, um, uh, they are uh, treated uh, the same as anyone who lives in the area. They receive the notice for this meeting and for other, the other meeting and for all for future correspondence on this. So they're notified. In terms of the issue of their deliveries, uh, a piece I don't know um, is what the existing rights of those businesses currently taking rear uh, deliveries that are further west than the, the, where the developer owns and whether they have what are called easement rights or other rights that it will allow them that. Um, the city will certainly be aware of that when we're doing that but I would encourage anyone who owns a property along Bloor that feels their rights might be impacted, you can also separately advocate for your rights and contact me if you want advice on how to do that. And further to that, um, I just wanna mention, yes, the TDC, they're always consulted, especially when they're next door to the property. And it's my understanding that the TDC is gonna be upgrading the type of streetcars and they'll be changing the track location sizes. Of them. So there's gonna be changes occurring, some significant changes in their modernization of it. And also there was a question on bike lanes. And if we could get Trevor Greenman unmuted because Trevor has some updated information on the bike lane situation. I think that was the last question. I think Bruna is working on that right now. Yeah. Hey, Trevor, are you able to speak? Trevor? I think we lost him. Yeah. He's unmuted. Um, oh, well, I mean, there are bike lanes there and they're going to be yep. permanently there and that yep. adds to the complexity. Okay. okay. Yes, it does. <laughs> okay. So, uh, the next question, Councillor, comes from Penny Adams Marchetti and uh, it reads, will this building be connected underground to the uh, UP station and then to the TTC, uh, TTC station, again, underground? Uh, that stretch of Dundas West is already inc incredibly dangerous. Yeah. So a while ago, the province of Ontario, oh, I, th this story goes back 30 years, but uh, the city of Toronto has been advocating for an underground connection between that GO station and the subway station for quite some time. It's the legal responsibility of the province of Ontario to make that connection. They did uh, initiate expropriation proceedings against the crossways because the basement underground parking of the crossways is in the way of the connection that you would have to make underneath Dundas West. That sort of has stalled 
I've written fairly recently to the province to ask for an update, and I've just been told something will happen, you'll find out, which isn't very reassuring to me. Um, but if there was a connection, it would be from the platform of the uh, Go UPX station to the platform of the subway, not to this building directly. Additionally, it's, it's almost impossible to get from that building to the TTC station. Underneath the, the ground there is the actual subway track. As well, there's storage track there for spare trains and for trains turning around. When we had the original 1540 uh, application, we looked at it and it, it's just a nightmare. So no, I can't see a connection from this building to the TTC or to the UPX station uh, underground just because of the configuration of the subway tracks under the ground. Okay. I've just asked, um, thank you, Councillor. Um, we don't have much time left, um, but before we go, I just wanted to show a graphic. I was gonna show it earlier, but I didn't wanna add confusion because there's a lot of layers with the zoning and just to enlarge this. And it's going back to the point with the uh, Avenue study had different land assembly options. And if you look on the left side, the applicant has most of the properties, except the one that I have highlighted in red, which is 1552 Bloor Street West. So because they're missing that property, they're not able to have that full build out of the 15 stories, 47 meters in height, as the councillor had pointed out following Peter's um, conversation. So that's why they had defaulted to the smaller area for the property at 1550. And then earlier I showed the four properties with zoning bylaw 438. So they have split zoning because they're not able to meet this full build out on the left side. So I just wanted to give that visual if that helps because it can be very complicated. But we're down to the last two minutes. So I think we're at the point of um, closing remarks. Uh, Councillor? Yeah, so I just wanted to thank everybody uh, who's, who's made a comment or just attended and listened. And I want to remind you that uh, we probably have another month before this comes to Community Council, uh, five weeks or something. And during that time, it is urgent. If, if something's occurred to you that you really feel Diane needs to understand before she writes her report, or that you want me to understand before I vote on her report, you can contact either of us. Just give us a call, send us an email, or if there's a question, something you didn't understand. This is an important moment for our community and it's really important that we hear your voice. Other than that, I simply wanna thank uh, the great staff team. I know I have a tendency to talk over them and I apologize, it's just my nature. Um, <laughs> and uh, to thank the applicants for, for making themselves available to, uh, make this presentation tonight. And most of all, thanks to all of you for being here. This is how we make the city better when we talk to each other. Thank you. And I wanna thank everyone for participating. The questions and comments have been fantastic. They're very informative and it's best coming from people who live and work in the area. Um, and I've been out to the site many times and I hope to meet, to you, meet you in the future as well. And Bruna's just put the slide with my contact information. So call me, email me, send me a letter. I'm happy to speak with you. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Thank you.